thanks so much for coming to listen to me talk tonight and to listen to all these other wonderful speakers. I will uh, be speaking about the probably the most boring topic tonight, which is, which is facts and uh, the dull, mundane things that uh, I work with. Um, so uh, I wanted to begin this talk with an anecdote. A friend of mine in 2010 uh, was sitting in a class at university on grand strategy, and he said, um, Professor, I want to ask you one question that remains in my mind at the end of this class. Why do conspiracy theories still exist? And everybody laughed in the class, and they were like, whatever, you know, the internet, you know, we've, we, we, we've got increasing access to information, um, conspiracy theories are going to be uh, something of the past. And that sort of remained in my mind after university as a question. And um, I feel it's grown actually much more pertinent since with the passing of time. Um, you know, people say that you have Google, you have Google Scholar, you have, uh, you have even Wikipedia with long articles uh, which are well sourced um, and people can, um, you know, see if something's is conspiracy or something's full of crap or, or whatever. Uh, I, not sure if this is the right venue to be, uh, to be swearing, but um, anyway, um, you'll forgive me. Um, I think that the baby has gone. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that there are a few people actually who would agree uh, with the assessment that it's easier to separate fact from fiction or fact from conspiracy these days. Um, it's been such a motivating force in the political arena um, that, uh, that it has kind of created this intense wave of populism um, throughout the world, and, um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful force. Um, and the rise of bog bogus news sites, mass, mass manipulation of information, and the use of social media platforms to spread misinformation has, um, has given the lie to the notion that we live in an age of facticity. I see people are getting nervous by, by my talk. Um, in 2014, so a little bit about me. In 2014, I went to work at the New Yorker's fact-checking department. I used to work as a fact-checker at The Nation magazine, um, another great magazine, but um, came to The New Yorker, which is a weekly news and, um, and features magazine. And we fact-check everything there. We fact-check uh, poetry, we fact-check stories, and, um, and it's a very, very engaging place to work. Uh, I said that almost five years, I left in December to do freelance checking and to do some of my own journalistic work as well. So I'll be talking about fact checking and a little bit about my work as a journalist. And I, I understand that there's probably very few people here who are journalists uh, tonight um, or editors or so on. Um, but uh, I think that we can all use a little fact checking in our lives. Um, you know, there are people with uh, social media accounts. I know there's one, uh, one person with a, a steak tartare reviewing Instagram in the, in the crowd, which is Mr. Tartare, you should check it out. Um, but, um, but, uh, but no, seriously, I mean, we all have, we all have our, it's, it's a great Instagram. Um, but um, uh, we, all, we, we, we all have our, our ways of making our voices heard. And, um, and we all vote as well, which is, which, which is perhaps the ultimate way in making our uh, of making our voices heard. So I think it's very important that we absorb some of the lessons of fact checkers. Now, if you cast your mind back to 2014, when I started fact checking, you know, this was the, the, this was the time of techno-optimism. People were saying uh, at cocktail parties to me, you know, your job is, is it's gonna end because uh, you got AI, you got algorithms. And, um, and I would sort of smile and nod and, Maybe feel a little bit worried as well <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> and then I get calls from uh, Silicon Valley people saying, "Oh, you're a fact checker, at the New Yorker. Uh, we, we've got this new fact checking app, and what do you do there?" And I would say, "Listen, um, it's, a, it's it's not really a special source. It's it's what my boss calls elevated common sense, but I think that it's something that we can actually uh, that we humans can do in in a way that com computers cannot. And I, I don't mean to be." a techno-pessimist because I love my telephone and my AI and so on as much as the next person. 
Um, and uh, so I just want to tell you a little bit about fact, what fact checkers do, a little bit about the history of fact checking at the New Yorker uh, before, um, before we end. Um, so the New Yorker's fact checking department was started by Harold Ross, who was the first editor. He was this kind of like tough, grizzled news editor. In 1927, there was a, there was a profile of the poet Edna St. Vincent Millay, and it was so ridden with errors that the, uh, that the poet's mother stormed over to the office and threatened to sue the magazine if the errors were not corrected. And um, Harold Ross was, was so upset by this that he sent out this, this memo saying, a special effort should be made to avoid errors in the New Yorker. Oh, forgive me, to avoid mistakes in the New Yorker. Um, you want to make sure that you've got your quotes fact-checked. It's one of the key, the key components <laughs> of fact-checking. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, and one fact checker said at the time that such was his zeal to avoid errors, and I'm going to read this off the uh, teleprompter. If you mention the em Empire State Building, Ross isn't satisfied. It's still there until we call up and verify it. So it was a sort of strange way of thinking. And uh, over, the time, uh, over time, the team at the New Yorker gained in people. Um, we're now 18 fact checkers. And they gained a, a reputation for being some of the best magazine fact checkers around. And that's not to say that other magazines, television shows, radio programs don't have fact checkers because they have wonderful fact checkers, they've got great departments, but I'll, I'll speak quite specifically to what the New Yorker does. Um, at the New Yorker, we mull over every article, we scrutinize it, we, uh, we weigh the facts, uh, we ponder and cross-examine them, and there's 18 people who do this for the print magazine, and, and something like five, maybe, maybe six now, the, I'm just, I'm I don't want to say anything wrong, but it's in the region of five web checkers, they're adding more and more uh, as the news cycle gets more intense. We put out more news uh, articles every day. Um, so, 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 so essentially, we have a whole group of people who are actually, you know, um, well paid, have generally have a, a, a steady career, and uh, who are learning and are young journalists, and they're very enthusiastic about their jobs. Um, and, and, you know, they're, they're kind of dedicated to the idea of the truth. And sometimes writers will get a little bit annoyed with the fact checkers. Um, a writer friend of mine uh, told me a story once about a fact checker who called up one of his sources to check whether she still had both legs. And he said, wait, I didn't say anything about her legs being blown off or something like that. Oh, no, 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 I just, just wanted to make sure because you said that you were walking in the piece and I just wanted to check that she could actually do that. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he said, okay, that's a very strange mindset. Um, and f in my experience, I remember there's a, there was a wonderful writer who uh, he wrote uh, these sort of beautiful, very descriptive pieces and then I'd come back and I said, listen, well, we need to change this, we need to tweak this, oh, this thing's slightly wrong. And, uh, and he'd go, dude, we're not writing a bloody legal brief here. And I would be like, okay, okay, <laughs> anyway. But um, we need to be factual. And uh, so I think this is a, it's a kind of important uh, sort of uh, mediation that one needs to make between being entertaining, um, structurally sound, but also being factual and being correct. Um, because especially what happens at the New Yorker, but, 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 but to be honest, any news media, on your social media website, on your, on your blog or on your Twitter, um, has huge repercussions sometimes, and people retweet it, and, um, and, and it kind of gains in, 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 in traction. But I'm getting ahead of myself. As fact checkers, we comb through libraries, dictionaries, court documents, and all manner of original sources to make sure an article is correct. So we spent a lot of time you know, Googling, double Googling, going to libraries, looking through dusty old tomes, going to courthouses, and it's kind of fun, fun sort of part of the job that actually, there's a huge research element. But one of the things that's unique about fact-checking at the New Yorker um, is that we actually call our sources back. So when a writer has called somebody, say, I don't know, John Smith, and, 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 has, and, and has, has, you know, got this heart-wrenching story about how John Smith's dog has died or something like that. You call, you call back John Smith and you go through the whole thing again and maybe you're re making him relive his trauma about his, his, his dead dog or whatever, but usually people get over that. Um, 
And, um, and basically what happens is, is that the dog, sorry, forgive me, the dog, the, the, the source um, will help you confirm, I don't know what's happening to me today. Um, but the source will help you uh, confirm the piece. And oftentimes, actually, they'll add more. And on occasion, um, uh, people will add so much to a story that it will get changed or will recast it or, you know, um, there'll be a whole uh, different set of things. But as my boss, Peter Camby, who is a long-time stalwart of the department, I believe he started in 1978, uh, but don't quote me, uh, he said, um, nobody should be surprised if they appear in the New Yorker. So nobody should pick up their New Yorker on Monday morning or Tuesday morning when their subscriptions arrive and sort of cough out their coffee because they see their name in the magazine. Sometimes we can't reach people, and that's for sure. And um, uh, there are plenty of people who, who, who end up that we can't reach. We've, we've spent weeks trying to get hold of them, blah, blah, blah. But more often, a checker will be up till 4 a.m., and they'll be making that final call to the person's dog's cousin's best friend's owner's uncle, and suddenly that person will say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, he's actually staying with me tonight or something like that, and, 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 and you say, okay, great, can I just have a chat, and then suddenly the whole story gets recast, um, and writers hate this, obviously. Um, but you'd be surprised at the wealth of information that these people often provide. And, uh, of course, many sources do try and backtrack. Um, we call this at the New Yorker source remorse, and um, this is something that basically, uh, you know, people feel like they have the right to edit their quotes, or people feel that they can, you know, they, they, they said to a journalist, oh, I, you know, I murdered my mother. And the journalist goes, oh, really? Well, that's, a, that's interesting, sort of takes it down. And two weeks later, they get a call from a fact checker, and say, so you told the journalist that you murdered your mother. Oh, no, 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 I never said that at all. And then, uh, well, it's, ne it's never that intense, obviously. But, um, but basically, you have to talk them down as a fact checker, saying, listen, you're here to verify the facts. You're not there to be their press agents. And one of the things, and now I'm going to get to the kind of uh, depressing aspect of the, 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 the talk, is um, how many, one, one of the things about source remorse is how many political figures, in fact, um, have this problem. And one of the indications that I feel, um, for me at least, uh, how broken the system is uh, between, uh, br how broken the relationship is between media and politicians today is how many people from Washington expect us to just parrot their line and change their line um, whenever we say, you, you, w whenever they say so. Of course, when that happens, we would tell them, again very politely, um, that we were only there to verify the facts and oftentimes that would result in very angry politicians calling the editor, and the editor would say, listen, you said that, and we've got it on tape, and that's what we're going to go with. Here's one of the key lessons I think I should impart tonight, is that fact-checking takes effort, fact-checking takes investment, fact-checking takes judgment, and fact-checking isn't simply passively uh, accepting something that somebody tells you or something that's on a screen in front of you. What is a fact? What is spin? There's an analytical uh, logic required of a fact checker, a human quality, as I said, which is not, which is not capable uh, uh, for a computer to, to compute. Um, and for those of you not in the news media, as I said, this is a skill that you can try at home. You can call people up who are in news stories, or you could, you could you know, uh, double check something against Google Scholar, or you can double check something um, even against news articles uh, in other publications. And oftentimes, you'll be surprised at the things that you find that people get, that get wrong. Um, don't simply accept what you see on a screen in front of you, especially a screen, but don't simply accept the, what you're told, but fact check it and um, make your decisions based on a multiplicity of sources. Try and call people. Try and go places. If somebody, if, if if you know, there's a report about a specific place that's supposedly terrible, or whatever, and you have the ability to go that, go go there and try and see it for yourself. Uh, I had actually this um, this uh, issue when I was writing a story about the Western Sahara, which is a divided territory in the uh, northwest corner of Africa, 
and it's split between a Moroccan uh, occupied side and a uh, rebel occupied side. And uh, the Moroccans say that the rebels operate these refugee camps that are in fact gulags and uh, that the refugees are held there against their will. So I wanted to go and fact check and make sure that that was correct. So I went there and sort of sat there and tried to double back and, and check if I was being fed spin and spent sort of two weeks doing this. And I, for myself, I managed to basically verify that these places were, were not in fact gulags but were in fact refugee camps. Um, and then I went to the Moroccan side to see whether there was a press blockade, as the, as the opposition have said, and, uh, and I was ejected from the country. So that obviously <laughs> affected my reporting. Um, so I only have two minutes left, which is surprising, because when I timed this out, it was 11 minutes. But um, what are you going to do? Um, obviously, some editors find fact-checking frustrating, but as, you know, as other speakers have said, take time, take time and, and think about what you're doing because it's important to invest that amount of research and, um, and to invest uh, those weeks reviewing stories all the while marking off facts with pencil strokes or spend a couple of minutes. Do as much fact-checking as you can, basically. Um, and in the end, if the news media gets things wrong, it's uh, a big problem and people become cynical. But I also think that um, what's really, really important uh, for, for us to think about tonight is how we can actually better become consumers of news media by doing our own fact checking, by trying to think about things objectively, and for sparing a thought for the fact checkers who have um, spent so much time laboring over those proofs and spending many, many weeks uh, uh, fact-checking, essentially. Anyway, thank you so much. I had to cut out a little bit at the end, but thank you again.